Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, November 7th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a look at the market action. The Dow Jones Industrial Average now up 340 points, trading at its highest level since the steep drop we saw back in October. S&P 500 following suit, up 43 points, nearing 2,800. The NASDAQ up 162 points, back above 7,500. And the Russell 2000 up about 1%, up 15 points, and well above that 1,550 resistance level that it was trying to negotiate. 10-year Treasury yield backing off a bit, down almost three basis points to 3.19%. Volatility index really dropping less than two weeks ago. We were up in the upper 20s. Today, down near 17, actually sitting right on 17, down 15% today with the uh, nice action in the market to the upside. Leading to the upside, a couple of familiar names. Healthcare back up on top. Huge move to the upside in the XLV, up almost 3%. The uh, XLK technology breaking back above key moving averages and recent highs, also up about 2.5%. Leading technology, and this is the one I've been waiting for, software. Big, big move today in software. One of the reasons Twilio came out with their earnings, stock up 34% today, huge move on Twilio and the software index in general. Financials lagging on a relative basis. They are up one penny. Uh, All the uh, sectors are up today, but financials clearly a laggard on a relative basis. Despite lagging, uh, we do have one of the financial groups, one of the industry groups, The uh, financial administration stocks, this is another group that had been leading the market similar to software, had been struggling for a while, trying to get back through key moving averages. Huge move up today in the financial administration space. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but Square, one of the big number or one of the big companies in that space will be reporting its latest quarterly earnings after the bell today. All right, Aaron. Wow. I tell you what, this is a big day for the market. Um, I've seen a lot of up days. But this is probably the most bullish day that I've seen breaking out above some key areas and leadership coming in from the right areas. How are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. I think the market is finally able to take a little bit of a breath. We've been breathless waiting for the elections uh, to happen. And now we finally have, you know, what's going to happen. Everybody knows the answer now. Uh, so I think the, the market's feeling a bit more comfortable, not as uh, concerned. So, uh, you know, I'm not surprised to see the rally. The question will be, of course, as we move along, whether it's going to stick. Yeah, and I, you raise a good point. Market doesn't like uncertainty. And even I think sometimes the market would like to just get news behind it, whether it's good or bad, and just be done with it, and not have to worry about it, because the market does tend to worry about things that it can't control. And now we've got the certainty of the election behind us. And uh, the market certainly not looking back at this point. Uh, we do have a special guest with us today, Brian Livingston. Brian, how are you doing this morning? Very good. It is a pleasure to have you back. I know we had you uh, in here several weeks ago. You are now writing at Stock Charts on a regular basis. Uh, I know you got a great presentation for everyone. Bring you back here in about 15 minutes or so, if you don't mind sticking around with us. I'll be here. Awesome. All right, Aaron. Busy, busy day. Lots going on in the market. What do we got today? Oh, absolutely. All right. So for our upcoming schedule, Grayson Rose will be with us tomorrow from Seattle. Mary Ellen McGonigal will join us for What's Hot, What's Not on Friday. And we have a workshop coming up for you, Tom, uh, next Tuesday. at this, Well, this coming Tuesday, I suppose. And then Wednesday, Bruce Frazier will be here. We call him Mr. Wyckoff. So I'm sure we'll talk a lot about uh, Wyckoffian analysis. All right. Uh, today, <clears throat> we just introduced Brian Livingston, and yes, he will be doing uh, a great presentation to start off the program. We'll then move into the 10 and 10, and our first symbol is going to be Darden Restaurants, D-R-I, if you want to go take a look at that chart before we do. And then finally, we're going to finish off the program a little differently. We'll be taking questions in the chat room for Brian, and during the 10 and 10, he's going to pretty much, you know, gather them all and then answer them uh, as we go along. So I think that'll be a very interesting segment. So stick around for that. But let's go ahead, uh, Tom, and get started with the technical news. 
Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. Well, actually, there wasn't anything of significance in terms of economic reports. So I'm just going to jump right into the 10 year Treasury yield. Take a look at what's going on here. I think, as I've said before, I think we've got a nice uptrend in play. Uh, potentially, this pullback could be establishing an inverse right shoulder. Here was what could be an inverse left shoulder. Move back up to establish the left side of a neckline. A lower low prints the inverse head. We move back up slightly upsloping neckline, which I like. Uh, uh, just with the last or with the highs the last couple of days near that 3.22% area. And now today we are down a couple basis points, actually three basis points right now to 3.18%. This could be a move back maybe to the 20 day, maybe a little bit just below that to uh, maybe mirror the uh, left inverse left shoulder could be an inverse right shoulder. Again, I look for continuation patterns after uptrends. Uh, no guarantees. That's what we have here, but it certainly does look like a possible formation that I would, continue to keep an eye on because if it does form and then we move back up and clear that 322, 323 area, you could go down and draw the measurement from the bottom of that inverse head up to the neckline. And in this case, that would be roughly about 16, 17 basis points, which would then take us up to 340 on a breakout. Um, would not be a bit surprised. Do want to mention that the FOMC meeting began this morning and uh, we will be hearing from the Fed tomorrow. I would say that most everyone is expecting no change at this point in the interest rates, but everyone will be waiting, uh, of course, for any uh, fresh wording or anything that the Fed has to say about future rate hikes and how many we might get. So a lot uh, still going on there. All right, let's turn our attention to the earnings. Uh, we have a lot of earnings still coming out. Not the big headline earning, earnings that we had the last few weeks, but still some pretty big companies. You can see on your screen there, 21st Century Fox did come up a little short on their bottom line, but the others listed there, Southern Company, Humana, uh, Rockwell Automation, Michael Kors, all did beat on the bottom line. And then, of course, after the bell today, we got a couple of big reports, Qualcomm reports, Prudential, Manulife, Square, as I mentioned earlier, Monster, and Marathon Oil, among many, many, many others. So we do want to kind of keep an eye on that. Let's take a look first at Fox. Uh, 21st Century Fox, F-O-X-A. Well, you can see on the chart, it continues to strengthen. Yesterday, we did manage to close at a multi-month high, getting above $47. And you can see that that strength is continuing so far today with the news out. Um, overall, I think this, this chart still looks pretty good. You've got the uh, PPO coming off that center line test, stretching uh, or moving higher. I think that is a positive. Uh, Fox did come up short on top line in addition to bottom line. I did not see guidance, but apparently the market giving them a pass uh, despite missing on top and bottom line. SO, this, this is Southern Company. Nice breakout here. Really a triple top around $46. We're getting that breakout. Pretty decent volume. Uh, Southern did beat on the top line $6.7 billion versus $6.68 billion. Bottom line, a buck fourteen versus a buck seven. Humana, Humana raised their guidance in addition to beating on the bottom line, and you can see the market rewarding their shareholders with a nice breakout above the three forty level. Super volume coming in. I think this looks like a nice breakout here. Um, Rockwell Automation, ROK, big downtrend. I'm not going to pull up the uh, Fibonacci, but we probably could, and we probably somewhere close to that fifty percent retracement here back to the 50-day moving average. They did miss on their top line. They beat on the bottom line, as I showed you earlier. Um, I would, I'd would, i like to see this breakout above the 50-day moving average. I'm a little nervous. And you can see going back the last several months, we had a breakout, didn't hold. We had a breakdown, didn't hold. I don't know. This is a company I think I'd avoid for now. Uh, Michael Kors, K-O-R-S. They missed on their top line. They beat on their bottom line. The big problem, though, was they lowered their quarter three revenue and earnings per share guidance. And you can see the stock really taking a hit today. This is one I would not touch for a while, let it settle down. DXCM, I'm going to give you a few more stocks I think look interesting today. DXCM, they uh, just beat on their top line by about 10% above expectations. Uh, the market was looking for a 10 cent loss on the bottom line. They reported a profit of 17 cents. So a huge beat there and they raised their fiscal year revenue guidance. All of that uh, resulted in a 7.7% rise so far, and now DXCM 
is up challenging the highs that we saw in September. ZG, we're going to go look at one on the opposite end of this spectrum here, Zillow Group. Um, really not very good action here. Uh, missed on their revenues, missed on their earnings per share. And I want to show you the relative chart. We do this a lot, but when you look at this relative chart, you can see that the publishing index right here, pretty close to its high that it had back in August. But look at what Zillow Group's been doing. Uh, awful relative performance. You can see it here in the relative chart ZG relative to its peers. Even before today, it was trading at a 52-week low relative to its group. Don't be shocked when you see companies come out with bad earnings. This is, you know, the analysts go out, they check with these companies, they see what's going on, they come back, they trade for their clients, um, you know, have upgrades, downgrades, so forth, based on a lot of the talks they have. This was uh, really not that hard to see coming, to be honest, based on the way the, the uh, stock had been trading. Twilio, this was a stock I featured in my Chart Watchers article back on Saturday. Uh, there were three companies I really wanted to watch this week. And I mentioned Twilio has been in, uh, basically uh, just an ATM cash source for traders in 2018. You can see the huge gap up with earnings in February, the huge gap up in May, the huge gap up in August. Don't be shocked, but stock up 33% again. 2018 has been very good to the Twilio shareholders. we got another breakout here. Very, very strong volume. This is in the software space. So look at what Twilio is doing relative to software stocks and relative to the S&P. And we've talked a lot about the weakness in software stocks, but you might find it somewhat interesting. We're not far from a relative breakout on software. So software went down a little bit faster than the S&P, especially in early October. But since then, it has actually been outperforming the S&P 500. And now we're seeing a huge move up in software stocks today. So trying to, to gather itself and provide some leadership again. FIVN, they uh, beat on top line, beat on bottom line, raised revenue guidance, raised earnings per share guidance, stock up 17% here. It too in the software space. So software you can see getting some pretty good news. Uh, a couple of others, uh, I know Aaron, you'll get a kick out of this one. Groupon, we talked about this yesterday. Look at the stock getting hammered after a slight gap up this morning. They came out. They missed on their revenues. They did beat on their bottom line, but they missed on their revenues. And they specifically mentioned Aaron Swinlin as a reason that they missed on their revenues. Of course, I'm sure they did. <laughs> I'm kidding, but you did say you're not uh, using the Groupon anymore. So I figured no. I was buying too much, so I had to get rid of the app. <laughs> It could be a sign, though. Maybe it is a sign. Maybe so. All right. Let's take a look at a chart here on the S&P 500. This is one that I've been pointing out a lot when we're in that downtrend on this hourly chart. We know we saw the uh, real estate group outperforming on a relative basis, the XLU utilities outperforming on a relative basis, and the XLP versus the XLY was trending higher. I didn't extend this annotation out, but you can see the XLP versus XLY, that uptrend is breaking. We've already seen it break on the XLU versus S&P 500. The last one left is real estate. Uh, this has been a pretty significant sign in the past when these relative uptrends break in the short term for these defensive areas of the market. And we've already gotten price break out of the down channel. So I see a lot happening here that's very bullish. I'd also mention 2760 was a key area on the S&P 500. We have surged through that level. Looks to me like we're going to go back and test that area in maybe the third, fourth week of October, up around 12, 2810 to 2820. That's the next level here. All right, uh, why don't we move on? I know we got some upgrades, downgrades. We got everyone patiently uh, waiting, Brian coming in. So Aaron, what do you have? All right, let's go. All right, let's get it started. We're gonna start with uh, ABMD. Uh, a biomed. This one was upgraded by Morgan Stanley from an equal weight to an overweight. Uh, I've gone ahead and annotated this chart among others. As you can see, we had already broken this declining tops trend line, this declining trend, and then we did form a flag. This is a breakout from that flag. And when you look at the height of this flag, we're talking about a $80 at least. Uh, to the upside. So 480 seems uh, certainly possible here for ABMD on this upgrade. 
All right, next one that we had that was upgraded today, New Relic, uh, first analysis securities, upgraded it from an outperform to a strong buy. And investors definitely are liking this. Look at the breakout from this consolidation zone that we've been uh, in the middle of most of October. Beautiful breakout, heading straight up. You can see right here, the $95 range was also an area of resistance and price just burst right on through that. Uh, I think that New Relic is looking very good right now. Personally, I'd like to see a pullback before I could get into it, but um, you know, it might be time to just get in and, and uh, hold on because I think we are looking at some more upside. We may not get that pullback. Uh, PMO buy signal had already come in, as you can see, back uh, the later uh, last week of October. Uh, so we did get some warning. Uh, by We got an attention flag by the PMO on its uh, buy signal that we should have uh, expect more rally. Uh, of course, we didn't know we'd get this kind of a, a break to the upside, but at least the PMO was on top of that. All right, uh, Progressive Corp uh, and Insurance, PGR. This one was upgraded by Morgan Stanley from an equal weight to an overweight. Uh, you can see that right now this, this PMO buy signal is coming in today. Uh, we had a consolidation zone that we've been in for the last part of October for Progressive. We broke out with a gap up and have broken out above this overhead resistance on a 5% move today. So we did get the buy signal, but uh, you know, mostly due to the fact we had a gap up and we're looking at a move of 5% currently to the upside. I think this one still looks pretty good. Uh, I would bring this into a weekly chart here to look at it just a little more closely. And you can see we are bumping a up against all-time highs. So uh, progressive looking pretty good and notice the PMO on the weekly chart. We had that bull kiss, the little fake out head fake, and now we're heading back up. Uh, I think that's also positive for progressive. A couple other big name upgrades that I didn't uh, go over. Noble Energy, NBL, was upgraded by two different agencies. Nutrien, NTR, was also upgraded today. Occidental Petroleum, OXY, and Spark Therapeutics, which is ONCE, is their symbol, O-N-C-E. This one was upgraded by three different agencies. And then Zion uh, Bank, uh, Z-I-O-N, was also upgraded today. So let's look at a couple of these downgrades. I have two of the two charts to show you. All right, the first one is uh, AIG, and this one was downgraded by Evercore from an outperform to inline. So we're not talking about a, a horrible downgrade. Uh, it's mainly moving into sort of that neutral uh, area. I think this is really quite interesting because I do see a PMO buy signal lining up. The big problem is this overhead resistance. And I know you can't see where that lines up, so I'm gonna show you the weekly chart very quickly here. You could see that the long-term resistance line, and I'm gonna go ahead and annotate this right here, because I think it is important. Look at the $45 area right here. We have three touches of this uh, support line, uh, now resistance line, and we've got to make our, we've got to get back above that. So I wouldn't be making any moves or getting too excited about uh, AIG. Uh, did get the downgrade, uh, but we are still on a almost two and a half percent move to the upside for the week. I don't think that investors are too bothered by this, but I would say uh, watching this chart, watch that $45 level. That's going to be the important one. All right, final one, FCX. Get over there. Freeport McGrowen. McMoran. Uh, this one was uh, downgraded today by RBC Capital from sector perform to underperform. So this is not the, the kind of downgrade you want to see. Uh, we're not going to neutral, we're going into negative. You've got a PMO buy signal lined up here. The declining trend was broken, but you can see it's the price is still moving lower. It's just barely staying above that declining tops trend line. Uh, if you look in the, the uh, thumbnail, you could make a case for a flag, but with the downgrade, I'd be very careful with this. And again, $13, if you look, is a pretty important area of overhead resistance. 
as well. So, I mean, if you wanted to get in and, and ride it up to that overhead resistance, you could certainly do that. Uh, honestly, based on a PMO buy signal. So I think uh, price is still looking fairly healthy here. But, uh, you know, I don't know about bottom feeding this one on a downgrade. I'd just be very careful with that one. Other downgrades I didn't go over, Frontier Communications, FTR was downgraded, Zillow, ZG was downgraded, Ironwood Pharma, IRWD was downgraded by two agencies, Monroe Capital, MRCC was downgraded by two agencies, and a Biotech, Mind Body MB was also downgraded by two agencies, if you want to take a look at those later. All right, that's all I had for upgrades and downgrades. It is time. Brian, are you out there and ready? I know we've got lots of information for you to uh, present to us. I'm all ready to go, Aaron. Excellent. Let's get started. Today, I'd like to talk with people about the uh, revolution that we are experiencing in the financial markets. It's absolutely incredible that trading costs are extremely low. It used to cost people 2% just to buy and sell a security, and now it could be as little as a penny. So we're really in an opportune time for uh, taking advantage of these new kinds of financial instruments that really didn't exist before the 21st century. I'm going to be talking about the Muscular Manifesto, which is my first column that appeared in StockCharts.com last week. And we're going to go through some of the points that I think people need to know about. We have an incredible audience of people out there. The number of people who are trading on the internet is supposedly growing 40% a year. And more and more people are coming on. More and more people have wealth, have accounts that they need to manage, but they haven't ever taken a class in how to manage it. Of course, stockcharts.com is a great way for people to learn how to manage their accounts. And so let's look at who some of those people are that we're talking about out there. There are more than 100 million different accounts that people have in the English-speaking countries alone that are 401ks, IRAs, or similar tax-deferred accounts, whatever the name might be. In Great Britain, they're called ISAs. In Canada, they're called something else. So if we look on the map here, um, obviously, uh, the US and Canada are great English-speaking countries. But also the UK, and surprisingly, The Scandinavian countries um, have a very high penetration of people who are speaking English, 70%, uh, 80%, according to this chart, which is from Wikipedia. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, of course, have numerous, uh, mostly English-speaking people, but also India shows up as having 10%, 15% of its citizens who are able to converse in English. So if you look at this, vast English-speaking audience out there who can take advantage of stock charts and who can take advantage of uh, my own newsletter, my own website. There are just hundreds of millions of people who are affected by the opportunities that we have now to uh, invest and trade in the market. When we look at the situation in the market, we find difficulties. It's been shown in numerous studies that Trading is something that our minds are not particularly good at. If we were going to be playing against one of the chess grandmasters of the world, would we choose our own moves by guesswork or would we use a supercomputer? It's been shown over and over that computers beat the best human game players in not only chess, but also in Go, also in Jeopardy, which is the trivia game on TV. Studies show that uh, fewer than 2% of day traders make consistent profits, and that means they are profitable uh, in one calendar year and in the next calendar year as well. It's a difficult thing. It's not easy. People look at the market as though it's easy to trade. It's something that uh, our minds are not ideally suited for. So how can we take advantage of the markets that are presenting opportunities to us the type of portfolios that 
the mass of people have been instructed to use for the past 40 years are called lazy portfolios. These are portfolios that have index funds, whether they're mutual funds or exchange traded funds, that track a particular market. It's been shown that index funds capture 99% of the return of any market that you might be interested in, whether that's US stocks, developed country stocks, emerging market stocks, and also other markets like commodities, precious metals, bonds, and real estate. So the people who could benefit from a new approach to using today's index funds and today's extremely low trading costs, if 2% of traders make consistent profits every year, that means that 98% do not. They might be interested in an approach that uses a gradual asset rotation towards those assets that are in uptrends and away from assets that are in downtrends. So in the top half of this screen, we see traders who may be making profits, may be making losses. Uh, more than 85% of intraday traders make losses over any given 12-month period. It's a, a difficult thing for our minds to grasp that we might not be able to uh, control our emotions, control our opinions, and trade in a way that's going to be consistently profitable. In the bottom half of this screen, we see people who are perhaps managing their 401k plan or their IRA or their Roth. And those two kinds of people, the traders who aren't really convinced that they are grandmasters of trading really, the 2% who really make consistent profits, and the people who have very different trading needs, who have 401ks and IRAs, those 100 million households out there need something to educate them, to train them, to help them along with how to manage their portfolios. The reason it's so difficult for us to manage our portfolios by ourselves is the way our brains have evolved over tens of thousands of years. When we are in some kind of a logical situation, our uh, prefrontal cortex on the left is in control. This is the logical thinking part of the brain. But when we've experienced a financial loss, control switches over to the amygdala, which is on the right half of the screen, a smaller, more primitive area of the brain that's in charge of fight and flight. The amygdala makes bad financial decisions. It's been shown again and again that when you let your fear center make decisions, you are going to make decisions that are explained to you by your verbal center as being logical and, and correct, but actually are poorly thought out. One study showed that traders buy stocks that go up 5.7% in the next 12 months, but the stocks they sold to get the money to buy those stocks went up 9%. So what we bought went up 5.7% and what we sold went up 9%. Our opinions fail us. They trick us into thinking that we're making good decisions when in fact we may be hurting ourselves. We may be giving ourselves long-term performance lower than we would like. Other studies show that investors who make fewer trades make more money in the market than investors who make more trades. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to the trading geniuses. You have people who are truly inspired, truly make the best decisions, and really are the grandmasters of the market. Those of us who are just average may not benefit from that kind of uh, brilliance that you see from the real stars of the trading world. In this graph, we see that the one-fifth of traders who made the fewest trades actually outperformed an index fund that tracked the U.S. stock market. As people made more and more trades, not only is their amygdala making them make bad decisions that they're not aware of, but they're also incurring expenses. The expenses may be small, they may be uh, a few fractions of a percentage point, but that still adds up over the course of a year. And anything that you spend on expenses, of course, this year is money that's not going to compound in your favor in years to come. This kind of bad uh, uh, opinion about trading shows up in what's called the behavior gap. So this slide shows one study from Charles Roteblut of the American As Association of Individual Investors. What if we took an average uh, individual 
a person who doesn't pay too much attention to the market, but definitely takes an interest when they see that the market is crashing, when the market has entered bear market. So this individual has an index fund holding the S&P 500, but on December 31st of a year when the market was down more than 20%, that individual switches to cash. They stay out of the market for the next 12 months before finally getting back in. That would have put them in cash at the end of 2002, and it would have put them in cash at the end of 2008. Unfortunately, that is a poor decision. You're buying high and you're selling low. You're selling when the market is down. So this individual, just by making those two decisions, actually hurt his or her performance by two percentage points. What we call the armchair investor, who doesn't really pay attention to the market and doesn't keep up with the market, uh, only made 3.4% annualized. If a person had stayed with the S&P 500, they would have made 5.4% annualized. That's your two percentage point behavior gap. Now, it's difficult for people to stay with any one asset class like the S&P 500. The index is very crash prone. Who would have wanted to stick with the S&P 500 all the way down through the dot-com crash when it was down more than 40%? And not very many people would want to stay with the S&P 500 all the way down to the bottom in the global financial crisis when it was down more than 50%. For this reason, lazy portfolios are hard for individuals to follow. The lazy portfolios, which just keep the same position all of the time, year after year, expose people to these huge losses. Equities crash and even bonds go down. Today, when we have a rising interest rate environment, we may find that bonds are not going to be a safe place for people to hold their 401ks, hold their IRAs. The opposite of lazy portfolios are muscular portfolios. What I've found and what is documented in the book, Muscular Portfolios, is that when you have a diversified portfolio and you check your portfolio once a month, you use asset rotation to move your portfolio away from assets that are in downtrends and toward assets that are in uptrends. You avoid the crashes that the S&P 500 subjects individual investors to about once every 10 years. In this simulation, which is by the quant simulator uh, produced by Mebin Faber, the author of the Ivy Portfolio, we see a 43-year period. Of course, ETFs didn't exist in 1973. Most mutual funds weren't index funds in 1973. But we have to use something to show ourselves. If the markets continue to have bull markets and crashes in the next four decades, like they have for the past four decades, what would have happened if we had had low-cost index funds like we do today and we had low trading costs like we do today? In this case, we see that by having a diversified portfolio, holding at least three different asset classes at all times, and by making a gradual change in our portfolios once a month, looking at what is in an uptrend and what's in a downtrend, and gradually shifting from assets that are in downtrends to assets that are in uptrends, we see two portfolios that are documented extensively in the book. The Mama Bear portfolio, which holds three asset classes and makes a change only once a month, and the Papa Bear portfolio, which holds three asset classes and makes a change only once a month. These portfolios are designed never to lose more than 20% or 25% in even the worst market crashes that we've ever experienced. That is designed for the people, the 100 million households out there who have IRAs, 401ks, and similar kinds of savings programs so that they never experience the fear and the, the crashing that the S&P 500 exposes people to about every decade. In this four decade period here, you can see that we had a 40% loss on the S&P 500 in 73, 74, 30% loss just in the 1987 crash, 45% uh, loss in the dot-com crash, and more than 50% loss in the global financial crisis. By contrast, you had losses that were no more than 25% in this very severe 1987 crash and no more than 21% during the financial crisis by the Papa Bear, only 18% down 
by the mama bear. If people can tolerate those kinds of uh, pressures, they'll do better than the market because they're not losing half of their money in the market. That is where you really have a severe hit to your uh, long-term performance. Now, lazy portfolios are an example of passive investing. Day trading is an example of active investing. What we're talking about now in the 21st century with very low cost index funds, very low transaction costs is mechanical investing. You pick a computer formula that has been shown to take advantage of diversification and take advantage of momentum in the marketplace. You follow that computer formula faithfully. Just as you were playing a chess grandmaster, you would take the moves of the supercomputer, make the chess moves that it provi provided and not use your own mind to make guesses. We have a need to go back in time, quite a long time to get track records that we consider to be reliable. Mark Hulbert has done studies of more than three decades of financial advisors who he has published in his Hulbert Financial Digest. He found that a strategy that was in the top one quarter of all performance for one year or five years or 10 years had no statistical significance. You did not see those strategies being in the top quarter of performance in the next one, five or 10 years. They tended to drop down into a lower performance category. On the other hand, those performances that had been in the top one quarter for 15 years were more likely than chance to be in the top quarter in the next 15 years. We need to have long track records. We need to look at complete bearable market cycles, which average about eight years, 10 years. So a 15 year period essentially uh, has two bearable market cycles. That gives us information that we can rely on that maybe we have something here that is statistically sound and is not just a flash in the pan. The, the short-term strategy of switching from one type of investing to another year after year even affects professionals. The uh, pension funds, large institutions who hire outside money managers, 100% of them will terminate an outside money manager if his or her performance underperforms a benchmark for as little as one, two, or three years. What they don't understand is that you need much longer periods of time to measure people's performances. The in, uh, financial institutions that let go the people who had underperformed a benchmark in the past one, two, or three years, the outside money managers that were hired to replace those fired managers, uh, the, the, the fired beat the hired. So if they would have kept those same managers, they actually would have had a better performance than firing them and getting the new outside managers. This is a way in which we see how short-termism can hurt even the performance of people who are financial professionals. Now, that all seems a little bit discouraging. I don't want people to think that we're completely pessimistic. The S&P 500 is a number, but it's not a number that's impossible to beat. It's not like the speed of light. It's something that simple strategies can outperform the S&P 500 over long periods of time. This chart is from stockcharts.com showing three different indexes that have beaten the S&P 500 over a period of the last 18 years. So this red line is the S&P 500. These are all index funds, the SPY or the red line. And you see how the red line is the lowest line on this chart. It's been beaten quite significantly by the Russell 1000, which is the 1000 largest companies in the US, much more diversified than the S&P 500. That's the blue line, and it's beaten by the Vanguard Total Market Index, which is more than 3,600 stocks. But really, uh, the champion of the past 18 years has been the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the dowdy old 30 stocks that are in the Dow Jones Industrials. And that has outperformed the S&P 500, not just for the past 18 years. We can't go farther back than this because we're using real index funds here, not the index itself. But the Dow far outperforms the S&P 500 over long periods like this because 
it has a low turnover, it has a, a, a momentum factor within it, choosing those stocks that have done well and are expected to do well in the future. Other people who have the ability to outperform the market include the managers of university endowment funds. This picture is Yale University. Its uh, performance was 12% annualized in the 17 years ending June 2015, the same period that the S&P 500 returned only 5.5% annualized. This is true of other university endowment funds, Princeton, Stanford, uh, MIT. They have outperformed the S&P 500 over long periods of time, 10, 15, 20 years, not by day trading, not by rapidly moving in and out of stocks, but by holding a diversified portfolio and using the rule of momentum to move more of their assets into asset classes that are going up and keep out of asset classes that are going down. It's not at all impossible to beat the S&P 500 as these university endowment funds have shown. The same strategies that they use can be used by individual investors without becoming day traders, without incurring the costs and expenses of trading every day. You can do this even in a 401k or an IRA, and most 401ks in the United States prohibit account holders from trading more often than once a month. So muscular portfolios are a solution to those people who have difficulty uh, even buying stocks in a 401k, most of which prohibit buying stocks and only provide mutual funds and ETFs. Lazy portfolios are really what we're suffering from in the market for people who manage 401ks and IRAs. They have been advised just buy five or six or seven different types of assets using these index funds and hold them forever. By developing muscular portfolios and finding portfolios that have been developed by experts like Mebin Faber, the author of the Ivy Portfolio, and Steve LeCompte, the CEO of CXO Advisory Group, we can show people how they can manage their money and achieve financial freedom. They can make enough money just in their 401ks and IRAs that they can quit their jobs and do whatever they like. We need to be careful about assuming that things that might have worked in the past in academic studies will work in the future. We see from this study for I, by AQR that uh, when academics publish white papers on the small cap effect where small cap companies outperform large cap companies, most of that outperformance disappeared soon after the pa papers were published. So on the left, the small cap factor was outperforming large caps 7% a year. After the publication, that almost entirely went away, less than 1% outperformance after the publication of those papers. The same is true with value. Do value companies outperform growth companies? Uh, if you measure book to price, uh, almost all of that effect went away after the publication of those papers. If you use a blend of value factors, only two percentage points of outperformance are left. However, what AQR found is that the momentum factor continued to mostly work even after it has been published in 1993. So 25 years later, we're still finding that you can get some big improvements in your portfolio by taking advantage of momentum, meaning which asset classes are in uptrends and which asset classes are in downtrends and gradually shifting your portfolio accordingly. What we've done with the website muscularportfolios.com is post the ratings of the inexpensive index funds as how they are doing with their momentum today. This is the Mama Bear portfolio. Its rule is how well did these index funds perform in the last five months? And the Papa Bear uses a different formula, which is how did these asset classes perform in the last uh, three, six, and 12 months average? This is something that's absolutely free. I think there are going to be dozens of websites that pop up that start showing these statistics absolutely free. We are going to take away a tremendous amount of business from the giants of Wall Street, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, they just will not be able to keep charging their one, two, three percent fees per year for advice which you can get for free on the internet. So at this point, why don't I wrap up and take any questions that you might have? 
All right, Aaron, uh, did we have any questions in the room? Uh, yeah, we actually did have two of them. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to answer them now, Brian, or if you want to prepare them for the end of the segment, but uh, let's see here. We had, uh, where, where did the brokers make up for the loss they incurred in this new price commission reduction that you're talk you've been talking about? So how, how are they making up for that? Do you happen to know? I think the stockbroker industry is facing a tremendous amount of pressure. The internet has put a lot of travel agents out of business. There used to be thousands of travel agents, and now there are only a few. You can go to a website and get a plane ticket or buy a hotel room, and you don't need a travel agent anymore. That same process now is happening on Wall Street. We are going to see a lot of people losing jobs with high-priced advice that simply is not as good as you can get now on the web for free. Yeah, I, I totally agree. All right, um, I have one more so far. Um, are you familiar with the John Bogle method of index investing? And, and what do you think of it if you are? John Bogle is one of the three experts who are profiled in the book, Muscular Portfolios. We look at this as having three bowls of money. Here we have Goldilocks who stumbled into a dark room. She sees on a large oval table, three bowls of money. The one on the left is labeled the baby bear portfolio. That is a clone of Jack Bogle's own strategy that he has been promoting for more than 20 years of just buy two simple index funds and rebalance them once a year and you will do as well as the S&P 500, which we show in the book. The middle bowl is called the Mama Bear portfolio, which we saw on that chart, that uh, involves making a slight change in your portfolio once a month and not making more changes than that, not incurring the costs of rapid trading. The largest bowl is called the Papa Bear portfolio. That is the portfolio that we have found has the best chance of beating the S&P 500 over long periods of time. That is what we have documented is what is it that Jack Bogle is recommending that people do? What is it Steve LeCompte recommends? What is it that Meb and Faber recommends? They have really pioneered this new era of index investing. All right, that, and that was the only other question I had in the room. I don't, I, uh, don't know if you had any yet, Tom, but uh, I'm gonna pass it to you. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and I know there's a poll up uh, and I think this will be timely to see uh, how everybody responded to the poll. And then I would encourage everyone to uh, keep sending questions in because Brian has agreed to stay with us through the end of the show. And so if you have additional questions of Brian, uh, when we come back after uh, the 10 and 10 and the final market update, we're going to you know be able to enjoy some more of uh, Brian's look on the markets and, and investing and so forth. So uh, please keep those questions coming in. Here is the poll. Uh, how often do you change your positions? And uh, about one third say once or twice a week. Um, pretty close. I mean, another 28% once or twice a month. And then 26% uh, say less often than once, once a month. So um, mine are once or twice, I would be once or twice a day. <laughs> Yes, I was going to say, I knew what your answer would be. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't answer. I don't have a question. I can jump in here. You have about 54% oh, uh, of the people saying they trade only once or twice a month or less often than once a month. That's mm -hmm. about more than half of the, the people who are watching this program on stock charts are not trading every day. They're trading more uh, gradually and, and hopefully doing better. Yeah, I, I would... I have to clarify. I mean, I do a lot of trading, but I don't I don't get into a stock expecting that I'm going to trade it in and out in the same day. I mean, normally I swing trade. And so I normally am, look, am looking to hold for anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, I would say. And I didn't see that at the bottom of once a day or more. I read it uh, differently. I was thinking it was uh, less often, but I guess that 13% that category down there would probably be me. I do a lot of trading. Yes, I, I'm in that 50% that you were talking about once or twice a month, less often. Uh, I'm more of an inter intermediate term trader. So typically that's, that would be my answer. Of course, I have, I have done everything on this. <laughs> so at one point or another. Yeah, I would also say the volatility index impacts 
the frequency of my trading. When the volatility index is on the rise, I just think the risks are too great in the market. And I tend to just tuck my tail between my legs and, and kind of sit back and watch the market for a while, um, which is what I did throughout much of October. Um, but when the VIX is coming back down, and I know a lot of traders, a lot of folks out there who like to trade frequently like that high volatility and that, that those wild swings. But to me, it just creates a lot more risk that I try to avoid. I don't know. Does that come into to play at all for you, uh, Brian? Do you look at all at the volatility index, the VIX and these like what we just went through in October or you just stay the course? The remarkable thing that behavioral science has found is the less you trade, the, the, the more money you make. And the academics have shown that momentum is really a very strong predictive factor. So I would ignore volatility. I would ignore the VIX. The idea that you can know today what three index funds are going to do the best in the next 30 days is absolutely revolutionary. This is something that we can share with people all over the world, and it's not ever going to become overused because the mass of people are always going to be buying when the market is exciting and selling when the market is scary. So they are doing the opposite of what we're doing, just following this simple moment, momentum trend. Okay, gotcha. Well, uh, I know you've agreed to stick around for a little bit, so I'm going to encourage everyone once again, if you have questions of Brian, uh, some of the muscular portfolio uh, ideas that he's discussed already, send those in to us. Uh, we're going to have Brian stick around, maybe have another 15-minute discussion or so with uh, going over some of those questions. And in the meantime, uh, if you don't mind hanging around for a little bit, Brian, we're going to go ahead and get into the 10 and 10 and the market update, but we are definitely going to be bringing you back. I'll be right here. All right. Sounds good. A very, very interesting discussion. We're going to get back to Brian in just a few minutes. Aaron, what do we got for the 10 and 10? All righty. Let's take a peek. Uh, we have only about 20. So stocks requested. Generally, that means that uh, we have a lot of interest in what is being discussed by our guests. So congratulations there, Brian. <laughs> People are very interested in what you have to say. Let me go ahead and pull this up for us. All right, so I'm going to move this quickly to the RRG just so we can get a feel for what's going on. Uh, TNDM, Tandem, obviously an outlier. Uh, probably we'll look at that one. Uh, but as far as sectors are concerned today, Tom, of those 20, like I said, it's uh, symbols are in short supply right now, but clearly technology leading the way. Uh, with a close second for healthcare as far as uh, requests. So should be an interesting 10 and 10. Let's go ahead and get started with uh, Darden Restaurants, DRI. Okay, Darden Restaurants, um, I actually own it, so uh, I got to disclose that, I suppose. Um, first, I like the restaurants and bars. This is a group that has been strengthening even while the market was weakening in October. We saw restaurants and bars strengthening. I think this is a really solid group. It's part of the aggressive uh, consumer discretionary space. So I think all of that uh, is, it bodes well. I believe we're still in a bull market. I think the market goes higher. And so I'm looking for these types of opportunities. Now, when you look at Darden restaurants, it was one of the leaders, um, as you can see, going through most of the summer months into uh, middle part of September. We had a huge run. The stock ran from about $83 up to about 123. So that was nearly 50% run in about four months. I think uh, you got to give it some time to consolidate those gains. I think it's doing it in what could be a cup. Um, as you can see, it looks like a little bit of a rounded bottom. We're starting to move back up. I circled the volume coming in here. I do see some increase in volume. I think that's accumulation taking place, which I find to be very bullish. And these green arrows across here, notice that the, the pullbacks, after we broke out on the heavy volume back in June, the pullbacks, when we did sell off, we saw movement back down to about the 104 area. And when Darden sold off at the end of September and early October, we went down to this 104 area on three, four, five different occasions and held before we started to turn back up here. I think if we can break above the 50-day moving average and especially get through about 113, I think the trip back up to 122, 122 and a half is what could be a very quick one. And like I said, it is in a very strong industry group. It has been underperforming while it's consolidating. But I think that this consolidation is a bullish pattern, and I fully expect that we're going to see a breakout here on DRI. To the downside, I think I've drawn in the two key areas that I would watch. 
I think 104 to the downside is where we've had a number of key support tests and they have held. And then if we did happen to break below there, I would be looking at this gap support level at about 101. So I think that's a really critical area of support to the downside. But I don't know if we go all the way back down there, especially if the market continues to strengthen. Watch for a breakout above about 113. I think that would be a very bullish sign for DRI. Okay. Let's see. The next one is the most popular in the chat room as far as votes go, and that would be Microsoft, Mr. Softy. <laughs> All right, sticking with that software theme, I don't blame you. There's been a lot of uh, good uh, breakouts here in software today. Um, Microsoft, like the software group, like the technology sector, uh, really struggled at the 20-day moving average. And that has broken today, and it's doing so with some pretty good volume overall in the market. But if I just highlight the uh, tests here of that 20-day moving average, I mean, things since things start to break, down back in October. I mean, you can check, you can see all of these different tests right here at that 20 day moving average. And now look at what's going on here. Now, all of a sudden, off of an uptrend as we were moving down, we're starting to turn back up. And I think this too is giving me a feel of potentially a cup where we go back up and test that prior high. So I think if you mark that, you come down here and mark this low. And then where we're sitting right now, you can kind of see we're starting to turn back up. If there's one negative, um, it's the volume. Uh, the volume has been declining, although today's volume is going to be very strong. We are just past the halfway point of the day, and we've already done 20 million shares. So this one could be up in the 35, 40 million share range, which obviously would be much heavier than what we have seen recently. And it's a good thing because we're making a key breakout above the 20-day moving average. So I want to see volume picking up on this move. So overall, I like what's going on in software. I like what's going on here with Microsoft. And I would be looking for a test of that 116 level. All right. See, the next one I will give you is that outlier, Tandem Diabetes, TNDM. Yeah, I noticed it was way stretched to the right side of the RRG, which tells me that this is a stock that had been going up and was just way, way head and shoulders above just about every other stock in the market in terms of its strength. And you can see the stock ran from two dollars back in february to what 50 um in september so not too many stocks uh, have that kind of track record in 2018 so as it's been consolidating and it's moved down quite a bit from where it was that's what's dr dragging it down into the weakening sector now i don't view this as a bearish looking chart at all i think that we had a huge run up it's going to take some time to consolidate those gains i would look for that to continue and I'm going to shorten this chart down a little bit just so we can annotate it because there's just, I don't know, it's hard to, to see all those different levels there. Um, I think we're going to make a run eventually to test this 48, 48 and a quarter area. And I say that because I'm looking for some sort of a um, continuation pattern off of this uptrend. I think we established an inverse left shoulder. There's your reaction high. We've come back down, put in the head, nice reversing piercing candle right there on the bottom. I think we're slowly, you can kind of see this rounded bottom. I think we're making our way back up. I think we're going to make our, our way all the way back up to 48 and change eventually. And this is a stock that can move pretty quickly. Um, at that point, I'd look for maybe a little pullback, but I see this one going back up eventually to challenge that September high. It's just a question of how long uh, to me that we consolidate. Um, stock doesn't go up from four or from two to 52 in uh, 10 months for no reason at all. And I think this consolidation and basing period is very healthy for the stock, but I would look for a 48 test probably within the next several weeks. All right. Let's see. The next one I'm going to give you is how about United Continental? Uh, the only industrial requested, of course, airline UAL. Yeah, I love the breakout here. Um, we had a gap up, went back and filled. Actually, we went a little bit below the gap support level and then came right back up. Um, but I am seeing a lot of breakouts. I'll stretch this back out a little bit here. Um, I am seeing a lot of breakouts in the market. And the fact that the S&P still is well below its earlier high and you've got UAL breaking out like this, I think that's a bullish sign. So, uh, and airlines tend to like the end of the year. So the fact that we've gotten this breakout um, and we're in November right now, fairly early in November still, I think we go higher on UAL. To the downside, I'd probably watch that rising 20-day moving average, but I suspect we have more to go here. All right. 
This next one is uh, the only energy stock, uh, Chesapeake Energy, and they wanted to know specifically buy, hold, or sell. I know with mine, I would probably hold. Uh, not so sure I would buy at this point. Yeah, well, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, I just see so many. I'm a momentum trader. So I think over the past month, you can see we've had a pretty big drop down. We've bounced. We had an oversold condition. We bounced. I think we've got to get back through about 395 before I would even begin to consider buying CHK. I mean, maybe um, if the PM or PPO continues to strengthen here and we get one more test of that low and we have a, a higher PPO, then maybe. But I think, the, you know, there's there's a problem here technically, and that is that when you have a support level like this, right around the $4 level, maybe just below, and you lose it. And when you lose it, you can see the volume picking up. I would need to get back through that level and that 20 day moving average before I would consider it. So for me, I would not be in Chesapeake at this point. All right. How about, uh, let's see, AMG. We'll do that one next. That is, I believe, a financial here. Yeah. Affiliated managers group uh, downtrending. I'm going to pull up this on a relative chart. Um, because when I see this, not only uh, is the stock moving down on an absolute basis, but relative to the asset managers, it's one of the worst. And you can see this is just the asset managers going down. But here is AMG relative to the asset manager. So if you're going to get into this stock, number one, you're in, a, you're in a very weak part of the market and you're in one of the weakest stocks in that space. Uh, I want to do the exact opposite. I want to, as a momentum trader, I want the groups that are outperforming and I want the outperforming stocks within those spaces. So this to me is just no man's land. I have no interest whatsoever in stocks like this. I am not a bottom feeder. I don't try to catch bottoms. I don't look for value. I look for momentum. And you can see this whole move to the downside. And look at this volume that's been coming in. I mean, this is not light volume selling. There's a lot of folks bailing on this. The stock has lost close to 50%. Since that January high, the market's nowhere near that. So why is everyone bailing? I don't want to be holding and, and find out. So I would uh, avoid it. <laughs> yes, you don't want to be holding and find out the hard way. Uh, let's see, our only consumer staples request, Walgreens, WBA. All right, WBA. Well, here you do have a strengthening drug retail group, which I like. You've got one of the leaders of the space, which I like. And you can see that that has led to outperformance versus the benchmark S&P 500. And of course, that was one of the things Brian was talking about earlier. You know, it is definitely possible to outperform the S&P 500. And the best way to do it is in areas that are outperforming the S&P and in individual stocks that are outperforming the S&P. So I think right now, this is a nice uptrend that we've got with WBA. We are stretched. And you can see on the last few days, the volume seems to be uh, coming out down a little bit. So I would wait, but I would say probably a 20 day test. You know, obviously I'd want to see what's going on when it pulls back. But uh, off the top of my head, I would say coming back down and testing this 20 day, you can see not exactly right on the 20 day. This one actually went to the 50, but usually right around that 20 day or just below is where we're catching uh, support on WBA. So I would like it on a pullback. We move back three or four dollars. I would be uh, considering entry here. Okay, next up, uh, Fitbit. Mine seems to think that I'm not alive because <laughs> I, I don't move around that much. But uh, FIT Fitbit. Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like the change of character with this. I, I believe that was an earnings report just out a week or so ago. Very very heavy volume. I like seeing a reversal. Uh, like this off of a downtrend, heavy volume gap up and continued move to the upside. So it's not like this is a one hit wonder. Uh, we gapped up and we are continuing to move higher volume a little less today. But two of the last three days, you can see pretty strong volume on these moves to the upside. I think accumulation is taking place. I think there will be plenty of opportunities to get in because a stock that's downtrending. Uh, and when you reverse it, you're going to have some areas where you're going to see some resistance. First one, I would say, is going to be around 650. This is where we started declining back in June. We bounced. And then when we went through, you could see the volume pick up. We haven't been able to get through 650 since then. I would say we're going to make a run for it and then pull back. 
I think a couple of areas, I think the reaction low after this huge move up, that's where buyers came back in at 575 and you're going to see the 20 day continuing to rise. So this is the trading range for now that I would be using on Fitbit 575 to the downside and about 650 upside. All right. Let's see. Uh, second to last, not the last one. How about Disney? Yeah, I'm a fan of Disney. I think that the overall group uh, has been strengthening and Disney is not far from a breakout. Uh, when you got a stock that's only two or three dollars from its 52 week high, two or three percent from its 52 week high in the market that we've been in. Uh, I think that uh, bodes pretty well. I'm going to stretch this out to a year. I think there was a trend line. Yeah, there's a nice little trend line here on Disney that I certainly would keep an eye on. But if you connect these these lows coming across here, I think that you've got a pretty strong trend line in play. Um, as far as the overhead resistance, you can see we established it in early August, went up a little bit above it in uh, October when the market was pulling back. So obviously you've got a pretty good relative performer here with Disney. I think as long as it holds these, these lows down around 111 or so, I'd be okay with the stock. I think eventually we're going to break above that 119. I see a breakout coming for Disney. All right. And our final symbol will be Cisco, CSCO. All right. Recently, we talked about the other Cisco, the food company. Mm -hmm. uh, we will talk about this one. I like the break back up above the 50 day moving average. I like the fact that we keep putting in these higher highs and higher lows. I think that the uptrend remains intact here for Cisco. And so I'm still bullish. I think initially what I'd be looking for is a move back up to 49 to test this. But I think off of the overall uptrend, I could be looking at this potentially again as a cup, although I'd like to see a little bit more volume coming in on the right side of the cup. Uh, so maybe not follow that pattern based on that. But I do think that the key was holding on the gap support right there. We gapped up in August, heavy volume, went back down. We were below it intraday. We held it on the close. And now we're rallying again. I think we're, if the market breaks out, you know, and continues moving higher, I think Cisco is going to be one of the leaders. If we go sideways and consolidate longer in the market, then I would look for this range for consolidation on Cisco. But I do think you've got a relative outperformer here. And eventually I'd be looking for a breakout sideways consolidation after an uptrend in my book is bullish. All right. And that is it. That completes the 10 in 10. Right now you are looking at the symbols we just covered. These annotated charts will be in the Market Watchers Live chart list. And you can find that chart list by going to the blogs tab from the main homepage at stockcharts.com. Click on the Market Watchers Live blog and the link will be right there at the top. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what's been going on. And I can tell you, I just took a peek and it's getting interesting out there. All right, as you can see, we're having a great rally today. It does not look like we're uh, ready to pull back from that rally yet. We just continue to be moving higher, making new intraday highs. Currently, listen to these numbers. Dow Jones is up almost 1.5%. The S&P 500 is up 1.6%. The NASDAQ is having a great day, up 2.12%. And uh, the OEX is up 1.7%. And I don't have the NASDAQ 100 chart on here, but the NASDAQ 100 is up over 2.5% right now. So definitely having a big rally day after election night uh, tallies were finished. Uh, the market is now not seeing that uncertainty, and it seems to uh, be rallying at this point. All right, S&P 100 and Russell 2000, small and mid caps are also participating in this very nice rally. TSX is moving mostly sideways, uh, but it is up right now, uh, up, up just a little over a quarter of a percent currently. Look at what has happened to treasury yields and back here at bonds in the last 10 to 20 minutes. We had a big move to the upside on the 10-year treasury yield. Currently, it's now reading at 3.208%. Uh, UUP, we saw a big gap down, moving sideways, trying to get up above that gap resistance that it formed, obviously, on the open, uh, but still lower on the day right now. UUP is down a little over 7 cents. Gold is 
On the positive side, GLD is up five cents to 116.09. Uh, but one thing to note, and that I'm having more and more problems with gold as I watch, when you start seeing the dollar have a bad day like this, you really need to see gold have a really good day. Uh, that would that tells you that it's not only the uh, price of you know the dollar uh, to determine what uh, gold is, but it also means there would be more buyers. So for me, when I see uh, that we're looking at an almost unchanged reading for GLD versus a UUP, a dollar down so far, that tells me that there are sellers and there are predominance of sellers right now for gold. So beware, be careful out there. TLT, as I noted earlier with those yields popping to the upside, uh, we can see that we're getting a big pullback currently on TLT. Uh, it is still up though, 43 cents at 112.80. And then finally, oil is trying to make a comeback to the positive side. Uh, looks like it might be forming a little bit of a um, ascending triangle possibly. Uh, so we might see it get back up to uh, positive territory, but so far, um, you know, it's still on the losing side down over half a percent, currently reading at 1310. And that's all I have for my portion of the market update. What have you got for us, Tom? All right. Well, I talked about software earlier, having a big day breaking out above the 20 day moving average. But another area of the market that has been extremely strong throughout the bull market, especially in 2018, is healthcare providers. And you can see the huge move today in healthcare providers. This index is up more than 4%, having just a, an absolutely fantastic day. It is breaking to new highs and resuming its leadership role, which I think is very significant. Uh, one of the stocks I just wanted to mention in this space is HCA Healthcare. And HCA had already been a pretty good performer, and I'll show you on a relative basis here in just a minute. But here is on an absolute basis, moving up more than 4%, trying to clear those earlier highs in October as well. So really strong day here. Here's the, uh, the HP, the DJ US HP that I just mentioned, breaking out there. And here's HCA relative to the healthcare providers. And we have seen continuing movement to the upside. So this is what I was talking about earlier by finding leaders in the market. You've got healthcare providers moving up, breaking out on, a, on an absolute basis. You've got HCA moving up relative to, the, to the, its peers, and then you've got HCA outperforming versus the S&P and healthcare providers outperforming versus the S&P 500. So I just wanted to mention that this is really a bullish day in the market. We've, we've got a trend day. I refer to a trend day when you move higher off from the very get-go and you just keep going higher. It just keeps adding and adding and adding on. That's what seems to be going on here. A lot of buyers, a lot of accumulation, and fortunately for the bulls, a lot of returning strength from some of the leaders from earlier in 2018. So all in all, pretty good day, I would have to say, unless we get a massive reversal later today, I think this really bodes well for the market heading into year end. And as promised, we said Brian would stick around with us. And Aaron, I know we got some questions, so I'm gonna let you take it away and Brian, pick up where you left off. Well, it's great to be here. And I'd like to touch on some of the questions that people raised in the chat room. Um, they're very good questions. Uh, one of the key questions that someone asked was, how do muscular portfolios relate to Jack Bogle's portfolio? And here we have a picture of Jack Bogle speaking at a conference. He, of course, is a founder of the Vanguard Group, which pioneered the first index fund that tracked the S&P 500 and now has scores of index funds in both mutual funds and ETFs. He has been an advocate for the past 20 years of a very, very simple investing strategy, which is possible in almost any 401k or any IRA, even those 401ks that do not allow you to trade stocks and do not allow you to trade anything but mutual funds only once or twice a month. His portfolio has been for the last two decades, just hold 50% US stocks and 50% US bonds, rebalance that at the end of the year in December or January. It's shown in our book, Muscular Portfolios, that a 50-50 portfolio gives you the same exact return as the S&P 500 over long periods of time. What makes that possible is that with 50% stocks and 50% bonds, you're not suffering 
these 40% crashes, 50% crashes, like the dot-com crash and the global financial crisis, not suffering those deep 40, 50% losses means you recover very much more quickly from the bear markets. Now, is a 50-50 portfolio a muscular portfolio? No. We call it a starter portfolio. It's ideal for people who have $10,000 or less to invest. When you have a small portfolio like $10,000, you don't want to be paying transaction fees. You don't want to be paying large fees to the funds. You want to keep your transaction costs down. And Jack Bogle's recommendation, which we call the baby bear portfolio, only requires two trades a year when you rebalance. That keeps your costs low. The muscular portfolios in the book are designed by two other financial experts. All right, Aaron, uh, oh, you have another yes. question? Another yes. question in the room. Absolutely. Aaron, so, just before you go into the next question, mm -hmm. here is the designer of the Mama Bear portfolio. His name is Steve Lecomte, the CEO of the CXO Advisory Group. And the designer of the Papa Bear portfolio is Mevin Faber, who is shown here in his office in Los Angeles. Uh, we call his portfolio the Papa Bear portfolio, which is the one that we found is the most profitable over long periods of time. We've gone back 45 years on how we would have done with those index funds. If they had existed 45 years ago, of course they didn't. Now they do. And how do we take advantage of them? That's what's interesting to me. Go ahead. All right. Excellent. Uh, so do these uh, mama and papa bear funds, are, is the retail offering available to average uh, U.S. investors? No. There is probably not ever going to be an index exchange traded fund that tracks the mama bear portfolio or the papa bear portfolio. That's because a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund that qualifies as an index fund and gives you those low expenses is supposed to track an index, duh. So what we are doing is taking advantage of momentum, a principle that has been shown in hundreds of academic studies to work. You look at those assets that have done the best in the last three to 12 months, they have a strong statistical likelihood of performing the best in the next 30 days. That's about all that you can predict. But it's enough for a person who has a 401k or an IRA who is only allowed to trade once or twice a month to gradually rotate their portfolio into those assets that are going to do the best. I'm showing on the screen the nine asset classes that are in the mama bear portfolio. This screen was taken months and months ago. It's not today's recommendation. You would go to muscularportfolios.com and click the mama bear portfolio and it will show you what are the top three rated index funds today. Those figures are updated on our website every 10 minutes when the market is open and the website is completely free of charge with no requirement even that you give an email to register. So to answer the question, can you just buy one ETF and it does the mama bear or the papa bear? No, and I don't think there will ever be one index fund that you can buy like that. You are going to have to watch your portfolio once a month, give it a tune up, about nine times out of 12 months of the year, there is one change necessary. Sell one ETF, buy another ETF. This can also be done with mutual funds if that's the only thing that is available in your 401k plan. It's something that people are going to have to check their portfolio once a month. Letting their portfolio drift month after month without checking it is a formula for your portfolio crashing. All right, Brian. Um, you know, one of the questions that also came in, and I think you're sort of answering it as we go along, but are the three bowls that we were talking about, you know, the, the Goldilocks, do they go up in aggressiveness as far as baby mama to papa? Yes, they do go up in aggressiveness. Here we have the old fable of Goldilocks, and she stumbled into the evil Wall Street banker's lair, and they have these three bowls, the, the baby bear, the mama bear, and the papa bear. As I've mentioned, the baby bear portfolio, we consider a starter portfolio for people who are just beginning to save, people who have less than $10,000 in investable assets. The mama bear is designed with a momentum formula that in the past 45 years that we've gone back with simulations, it never lost more than 18% in any down draw, uh, drawdown that you can measure from one month end to another. The mama bear portfolio 
uh, also made more than the S&P 500, but less gain than the Papa Bear. The Papa Bear portfolio is more aggressive. It uses a different momentum formula. It uh, tends to get in and out of the asset classes a little bit faster uh, than the Mama Bear, but that means that it's also going to be subject to losses of up to 25% in horrible, horrible bear markets like when the S&P is down 50%. So you get more gain with the Papa Bear, you have to be willing to tolerate losses of 20% to 25% in these horrible crashes. Many people have chosen the Mama Bear who've read the book and they've told me, you know, I really don't like these crashes at all. I would really like the smallest possible drawdowns during a, a, an SP 500 bear market. So I'm going to stick with the mama bear, even though I might make a little less money over time. I just don't think I can handle my money being down 25%. That's the choice that the investors can make. And it's surprising to me to see why people explain, I would like to use the papa bear. I would like to use the mama bear. I would like to use the baby bear. We have a decision tree in the book. You answer four questions. They're yes and no questions. They tell you exactly which portfolio would be best for your particular needs. All right, excellent. Um, let me give you uh, one more. I know Tom, you said you had one. Um, do you ever, does the muscular model ever raise significant cash positions? The answer is yes. You can get a significant cash position. The Mama Bear portfolio includes two different types of fixed income funds. The Papa Bear portfolio includes four different types of fixed income funds. Both the Mama Bear and the Papa Bear also have the ability to rotate into commodities and rotate into uh, gold. Now, you don't want to be having commodities and gold all of the time in your portfolio, like some lazy portfolios do. You want to use momentum to see which asset classes have the best odds of going up in the next 30 days. Sometimes you'll be um, in commodities and sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll have all three of your ETFs in the uh, index funds uh, that are fixed income and sometimes you'll have all three of your ETFs in equity-like assets, whether it's developed country stocks, emerging market stocks, or US stocks. This is something that it's really remarkable. You can have a very simple formula that looks at momentum and says what three asset classes have a statistical probability of going up in the next 30 days. And you can reveal this to everybody and it doesn't become overgrazed. It doesn't wear out decade after decade after decade. Traders have known for centuries that the trend is your friend. This is just an academic prov proving of what it means to say the trend is your friend. Now we have computers, now we have free websites like muscularportfolios.com that show people exactly which index funds are likely to do the best in the next 30 days. That's not a guarantee, that's not an assurance, it's just statistically likely to be the best for you for the next month to come. In this picture we show Yale University, they are one of many university endowment funds that have well outperformed the S&P 500 over long periods of time, not by day trading, but by gradually shifting their portfolio from assets that are in downtrends to assets that are in uptrends. This is a revolution that we can share with people who are running their own 401ks, their own IRAs. Now they have a formula that is totally free for them to use and hopefully will give them better results and hopefully will keep them from crashing in the bear market that's certain to come. Okay, Brian, I think we have time maybe for one more question. And uh, my question is this, does the, or do your portfolios consider currencies at all? And the reason I bring this up is the S&P 500, of course, topped at the end of September, and we saw a really brutal four or five week stretch. But during that time, the US dollar, the UUP, the dollar index bullish fund, rose about 4% during that same period as a lot of money was looking for safety. And so my question is, do you ever look at some of the currencies for investment opportunities in these funds? The muscular portfolios do not include currencies. What we see is that you get a tremendous amount of diversification with equities, commodities, precious metals, and fixed income. In this chart, we see the correlations between equities, commodities, precious metals, and bonds. The equities around the world are very highly correlated. They go up and down very 
much in tune with each other. We see more and more correlation as communications around the world become more instantaneous. Commodities give you a tremendous amount of diversification and precious metals give you a tremendous amount of diversification. I would say a muscular portfolio holds commodities or precious metals maybe only 10 or 15% of the time. In the global financial crisis, the S&P 500 was down more than 50%, as we all are aware. But in 2007, 2008, Treasury bonds went up, gold went up, and commodities went up. Those were safe harbors for people. Those were places you could go that were in uptrends. That's remarkable. When the S&P 500 is crashing, there are things that are going up. There's always something that's going up. Currencies are more volatile. Currencies are maybe less predictable. Whether currencies behave according to momentum, I think is something that still remains to be proven. Obviously, there are some trading geniuses who are excellent at guessing correctly what is going to happen with currencies. We don't know whether individual investors really have a simple rule that they can use to profit from currencies. And certainly most 401k plans do not have any kind of currency exchange trading fund in their list of what the 401k account owners are allowed to use. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. Uh, we need to, to go ahead and start wrapping up here, but I thought what we would do is before you leave, Brian, just show everyone here uh, from the homepage. If you go into the blog articles um, and we pull that up under the menu here, if you go down to muscular investing, this will bring up uh, Brian's new blog at Stock Charts. So if you really like what you've heard here today and all of Brian's great explanations, uh, you'll be able to get some uh, pretty good information from his blog as he goes forward. How often do you plan to, uh, to publish articles in here, Brian? Muscular investing column appears most Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Okay, cool. Um, so if you want to go in here and check, you got a couple of uh, articles here already to take a look at. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. This is our second time, but I'm sure we will have you back here many, 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 many more times. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for coming on, sharing all your knowledge with everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, a lot of fun. Yeah, it's some uh, great information. I mean, that is one thing that we are not lacking at Stock Charts, information. We have, there's a tremendous amount of investing education with chart school and all, but then, of course, you've got all of the contributors that are providing their expertise and knowledge uh, in those blog articles and in their own uh, blogs and so forth. So make sure you check those out if you haven't already. Yes. Well, what are you thinking for the rest of the day here? A lot of people are asking, hey, is the volume strong enough here? Are the right sectors leading? What do you think? Well, I'm not as much of a volume fan on the way back up. First of all, panic volume is always going to be heavier than buying volume. Nobody panics to get back in. Um, in fact, usually when the market's going up, nobody wants to jump back in. They're afraid to jump back in. Panic, on the other hand, will force your hand. Everybody will, will sell off and that's why you, you always see those huge moves in volume spikes and so forth to the downside. But I think that just leads to capitulation and then we bounce. I am more, I'm much more um, in tune with what's going on in terms of sector rotation, which I really like today. Um, I like getting back through some key areas of resistance. So for me, I'm pretty bullish what's going on. How about you? Hmm. Well, I am. I do follow the volume patterns. <laughs> you know, the last time we had that big move to the upside, everybody was all excited. It came in with really low volume. And so I, I thought it was suspect. Uh, right now, though, I think we're, we're putting in volume, more volume than we did that last time on the rally. So I think, I think we're going to be okay here, but I'll definitely be curious as to what that turns out to be. Also getting some new buy signals on the DP scoreboard. So go check out the Decision Point blog. Absolutely. Now, one thing that would scare the heck out of me if all of a sudden these gains evaporated this afternoon, we had a big reversal. That would scare me. Mm -hmm. Short of that, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing right now. Anyhow, again, I want to thank Brian for, uh, for sticking around with us and doing the entire show. Always appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being with us today as well. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We always love to get that feedback. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everybody. See you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.